Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome as we celebrate the 31st Sunday in Ordinary Time. Uh, we welcome the people who are praying with us at home. There's an additional collection today in support of our food pantry. And this past month, the month of October, uh, our food pantry received 725 household visits and groceries were driven home to 411 households. We thank all our volunteers and you also for your generous support that makes all this good work possible. Please stand as we sing number 663 in your green hymnals under your chairs. continue our prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with each of you. And with your spirit. To prepare ourselves to listen to God's word this evening, let's just look back over the past days and acknowledge any way in which we have been less than truly faithful as followers of the Lord. For the weakness of our faith, we pray, Lord, have mercy. For our lack of hope, we pray, Christ, have mercy. And for our failures in love, we pray, Lord, have mercy. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sin, and bring us all to life everlasting.
Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father. Go away with the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. Receive it at the right hand. Gracious and merciful God, through your grace, we are able to offer you proper and praiseworthy service. Grant that we may, without stumbling, hasten to follow your Son in our path through life. And we make this prayer through our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Spirit, our God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Malachi. A great king am I, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. And now, O priests, this commandment is for you. If you do not listen, if you do not lay it to heart, to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse upon you, and of your blessing I will make a curse. You have turned aside from the way, and have caused many to falter by your instruction. You have made void the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. I therefore have made you contemptible and base before all the people, since you do not keep my ways, but show partiality in your decisions. Have we not all the one Father? Has not the one God created us? Why then do we break faith with one another? violating the covenant of our fathers. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. Brothers and sisters, we were gentle among you as a nursing mother cares for her children. With such affection for you, we were determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our very selves as well. So dearly beloved had you become to us. You recall, brothers and sisters, our toil and drudgery, working day and night in order not to burden any of you. We proclaimed to you the gospel of God. And for this reason, we too give thanks to God unceasingly that in receiving the word of God from hearing us, you received not a human word, but as it truly is, the word of God, which is now at work in you who believe. The word of the Lord. This is a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have taken their seat on the chair of Moses. Therefore, do and observe all things whatsoever they tell you but do not follow their example. For they preach, but they do not practice. 
They tie up heavy burdens, hard to carry, and lay them on people's shoulders. But they will not lift a finger to move them. All their works are performed to be seen. They widen their phylacteries and lengthen their tassels. They love places of honor at banquets, seats of honor in synagogues, greetings in marketplaces, and the salutation, Rabbi. As for you, do not be called Rabbi. You have but one teacher, and you are all brothers and sisters. Call no one on earth your father. You have but one father in heaven. Do not be called master. You have but one master, the Christ. The greatest among you must be your servant. Whoever exalts the self will be humbled, but whoever humbles the self will be exalted. The Gospel of the Lord. The name Gary Trudeau may be familiar to some of you. He's a cartoonist, and he's the one who does the comic strip Doonesbury, been running for decades now. And I remember reading an interview with him, and it was on the 25th anniversary of Doonesbury. And in the interview, he was asked, uh, you must have had various strange experiences with some of your fans and others. What was some of the things that happened to you because of your comic strip, Doonesbury? And one of the stories he tells is, he had, and some of you may know this, right? He's a, it's a fairly political comic strip. He has fairly strong views about things. And this comic strip, the whole week, was an attack on the Reagan administration back in the 80s. And uh, he gets a call that week, and it's from a producer of one of the Sunday morning talk shows who wants Trudeau to come on the air and talk about these comic strips that are attacking the Reagan administration. Trudeau wasn't interested in doing this, so he just ignores the message on his phone. A little bit later in the day, another call comes in. Same person saying, I'm trying to reach you. I want you to appear on our talk show this coming week. Trudeau ignores it. Well, this goes on for a couple of days. Calls coming in, and Trudeau has no interest in being part of this. Finally, at the end of the week, after several calls, the person calls up and is clearly angry and proceeds to call Trudeau arrogant, conceited, pompous. Who do you think you are? I'm inviting you to be on the talk show and you don't even answer me. You are so conceited. And Trudeau Thinking about this episode years later, he says in this interview, only in America would you be called conceited because you didn't want to engage in self-promotion. <laughs> and that story came to mind thinking about these readings today. The first reading from the prophet Malachi we don't know much about the prophet Malachi. He's relatively unknown, one of the minor prophets. He's writing in the fifth century BC, so in the 400s. By this time, all right, Israel has been restored back in Egypt. The Babylonian exile is long over. By this time, the second temple has been built. And so life in Jerusalem 
is sort of back to normal for people. They go to the temple to offer sacrifice. There is this caste of Sadducees, the priestly class, there who sort of are in charge of things in Jerusalem. And Malachi gives this prophecy in which Yahweh expresses anger at the priestly class, anger at the Sadducees, because Yahweh says they show partiality. And we may not have caught why that's important. But you see, it was the high priests who in fact functioned as the judges of life in Jerusalem. And of course, a judge should show no partiality. But these Sadducees do. And of course, the partiality they show, we find out in another passage, is not a partiality towards the poor or the weak or the vulnerable, but rather it's a partiality towards the powerful, towards the rich. And that's why Yahweh is angry with them. They are using their office, you see, to curry favor with the rich and the powerful. The second reading from 1 Thessalonians, this actually is, as you may know, this is the earliest text we have in the entire New Testament. All of Paul's letters are written before any of the Gospels are written. And this letter is the earliest of Paul's letters. He's writing to one of the first communities he founds in Thessalonica. And what's interesting about this, besides his obvious affection for the Thessalonians, is he makes the point, I labored so as not to be a burden to you. You see, the custom was when missionaries went out, the community to which they went supported them, took care of them, met their material needs. But Paul used to take some real efforts not to do that with the communities he went to. Paul was by profession a tent maker. Now that may not sound like a big deal, but in a society in which almost everybody has a tent on their roof because that's where people slept at night, outdoors, because you'd get some fresh air and some relief. Almost all homes were just one story. And so you went up to your roof and had a covering of a tent so that there you could get some rest. Away from all the animals that you had, they went into the first floor of your house. And so being a tent maker was, was actually a good profession and one could make money on it. But it wasn't an easy job. And Paul makes the point, I worked so as not to be a burden to you. Paul did not want to set himself apart from the communities that he served. He wanted to be one of the community. He did not see himself as someone special. He saw himself as part of the people to whom he was preaching. And his obvious affection for those Thessalonians is precisely because he builds those relationships of equality. He doesn't set himself above the people to whom he's preaching. And then the gospel today. This is the very beginning, the first 12 verses that we heard of chapter 23 of Matthew. The entire chapter is Jesus doing a rip on the Pharisees and Sadducees. We're just getting a part of it. It goes on. And Matthew puts this in, this long complaint of Jesus about the leadership at the time because of what's happening, right? Matthew's gospel was written around 75 AD, somewhere around there. Remember, Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Romans in 68 after they put down the Jewish rebellion. And among the things that got destroyed was the second temple. It's been desecrated and wiped out. 
the center of Jewish life and identity, obliterated. And so what happens, you see, then is, where does the religious center move to? Since it's no longer in Jerusalem at the temple, it moves out into the synagogues, out into the villages. That's where Jewish life is maintained. You go now to the synagogue because you can't offer sacrifice in Jerusalem anymore. And part of what's happening by the time Matthew writes his gospel is that Jewish communities are kicking Jewish Christians out of the synagogue. Jewish Christians are now being persecuted by their fellow Jews. And so Matthew recalls these stories of how Jesus would go after the Pharisees and Sadducees. And he sort of compiles these complaints into one chapter. Matthew sort of edits much of the material and puts it all in one chapter as one long speech by Jesus. It was probably a collection of multiple sayings spoken at different times and places. But he turns it into this long speech in which Jesus really goes after the leadership of the Jewish people. And as you heard there, why does he go after them? Because they do not practice what they preach. He says, listen to their preaching, but don't follow their practice because they're always looking for attention. Now, a word that is an odd one that you may have heard, uh, phylacteries. Phylacteries are simply, if you've ever seen an Orthodox Jew pray, they often put on these things, they wrap around their arms and also around their head. And it is a little box that's wrapped around and inside the little box is a verse or two of scripture that a person particularly likes that passage. That's a phylactery. And it's sort of like when we listen to the gospel, right? We say, may the word of God be in our minds, in our hearts, on our lips. It's something similar that they're doing, that God's word will be on my mind. And they wear it there as they say their prayers. And what Jesus points out is, these people, they love to make big phylacteries. Most people are content with a little phylactery that looks like a little locket almost. These people put on a big show of what they're wearing. These people love to be greeted in the marketplaces. These people want the best seats at any of the gatherings of the people. Jesus is going after them because he sees them as being pompous. He sees them as people who are caught up with themselves, who are in love with themselves. And so he goes after them. Now, the point being, all three of these readings are in one way or the other dealing with the presence, in the case of Paul, or the absence, in the case of the prophet Malachi and then Jesus, the virtue of humility. Now, before you get squeamish about humility, right, humility does not mean, right, making yourself into a doormat for other people to use you. Humility is not about debasing yourself. That's a crazy view of humility. Humility is not denying the talents and gifts that you have. Humility is the ability to see oneself in proper proportion to the rest of the universe. To be able to know your place in the scheme of things. To know truly who you are and what you are in relationship to others. That's the gift of humility. To see oneself truthfully. Humility, as Trudeau told us earlier, does not really have uh, a lot of resonance in American culture, does it? I mean, today, even the most minor celebrity, right, 
has a TikTok account, uh, a YouTube video, uh, you know, a Facebook page, a press agent, right? We are great at self-promotion in this culture. We're not very good with humility and seeing ourselves properly in the scheme of things. But that's what we're being asked to do in these readings today, to develop and to practice the virtue of humility. Now, what that means, I suggest to you, is to see yourself as you truly are. And here, of course, the great truth of all of us, the great truth that is true of all of us is that we are creatures. We did not make ourselves. None of us called ourselves into existence. And despite some playing on the margins with healthcare and modern medicine, there's not much we can do to sustain ourselves in existence beyond our time. The simple fact of the matter is, to be human, to be a creature, is to be finite. None of us is forever. And the real truth of the matter is, each one of us is absolutely unnecessary. There is nothing about us that makes us necessary. Philosophers like to use the word contingency. We are contingent beings. There's nothing necessary about our existence. So when you're faced with that, that that's our condition in this cosmos, that you and I, like everything else in the cosmos, is unnecessary. We are all creatures that we can't create ourselves or sustain ourselves. Now, faced with that, right, the alternative that many people opt for, of course, is despair. What's the point of it all? Why bother? It's all a joke. It's all a mirage. That's one option when you actually confront your non-necessity. But Christianity has a different answer. When confronted with the basic question, why is there something rather than nothing? If everything is non-necessary, then why is there anything? And Christianity's answer is, love. Why anything exists is because God has loved it into existence. Nothing that is, is except for God's love. It's God who calls things into existence. It is God who makes all creatures. It is God who sustains all creatures. So when faced with our contingency, our non-necessity, once we see ourselves as we truly are, there are some who despair over it. But Christianity's message is, knowing your creatureliness is not a cause for despair. It's actually a cause for joy. Because the answer then for why we are is quite simply that God has loved us into being. That the deep down core of all existence is divine love. Nothing is other than what God has loved into being. And so the Christian message, you see, fundamentally is good news. 
it is faced with our own seeming insignificance in this cosmos, faced with the vastness of all creation and our little role in it. There are some who despair. There are others, like the Pharisees and Sadducees, who puff themselves up and try and make something of themselves on their own, claim status and privilege and power, thinking that will stave off their insignificance. But what Christianity speaks about and must continue to speak about in every age and in every place, that the only reason we are is because God has loved us and wants to share life with us. And if that's not good news, I don't know what is. Let's stand and profess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. We come before the Lord now and one another with our prayers for ourselves, our communities, our nation, our world. For the church, may it be a beacon of peace in a world riven by violence. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. For the leaders of all nations, may they seek to end war, terrorism, and gun violence in every land. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have the right to vote, may they seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit and discern the most just options, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who struggle with addiction, may they find support on the path to recovery, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the people of St. Vincent's, may we continue to find ways to humble ourselves in service to others, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who cope with chronic illness, may they find comfort in family and friends, and may they be given strength in their challenges by the Holy Spirit, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Annette Schreck, Father Michael Fuford, Reverend Kevin McGrath, and all who have died. May they be rejoined in God's kingdom with those who have gone before, and may they prepare a place for us someday. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the needs in our book of intentions and for those that we keep close to our hearts, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the many blessings in our lives. 
And we ask that you continue to bless us with what we truly need in order to faithfully follow your son. We make these prayers in his name. Amen. 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 I invite you now, if you brought an offering, to place it in the baskets at the base of the altar platform. If you prefer to give online, you may do so by going to our website and clicking the donate button. Pray, my sisters and brothers, that these simple gifts may be acceptable to our gracious God. Amen. Lord, may these sacrificial offerings become for us a pure gift and an occasion for the outpouring of your mercy upon us. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Then let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Is right and just. Blessed are you, strong and faithful God. All your works, the height and the depth, echo the silent music of your praise. In the beginning, your word summoned light. Night withdrew and creation dawned. As ages passed unseen, waters gathered on the face of the earth, and life appeared. 
When, it, when the times had at last grown full and the earth had ripened in abundance, you created in your image humankind, the crown of all creation. You gave us breath and speech that all the living might find a voice to sing your praise. So now, with all the powers of heaven and earth, we join in the ageless hymn of your glory. As a mother tenderly gathers her children, you embrace the people as your own and filled us with longing for a peace that would last and for a justice that would not fail. Through countless generations, your people hungered for the bread of freedom. From them you raised up Jesus, the living bread, in whom ancient hungers were satisfied. He healed the sick, though he himself would suffer. He offered life to sinners, yet death would hunt him down. With a love stronger than death, he opened wide his arms and surrendered his spirit. Gracious God, let your Holy Spirit move in power over us and over our earthly gifts of bread and wine that we and they may become the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. On the night before he met with death, Jesus came to table with those he loved. He took bread and praised you, God of all creation. He broke the bread among his disciples and said, take this all of you and eat it. This is my body which will be given up for you. And when the supper was ended, he poured a final cup of wine and praised you, God of all creation. He passed the cup among his disciples and said, take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant. It will be shed for you and for all, so that sin may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. And now let us proclaim this mystery of our faith. God, we commemorate Jesus, your Son, as we offer you his sacrifice. Death could not bind him, for you raised him up in the spirit of holiness and exalted him as Lord of all creation. May his coming in glory find us ever watchful in prayer, strong in love, and faithful to the breaking of the bread. Rejoicing in the Holy Spirit, your whole church offers thanks and praise. Together with Francis, the Bishop of Rome, and Edward, our Bishop, and all whose lives bring hope to this world. Lord of the living and the dead, 
Awaken to the undying light of pardon and peace, those fallen asleep in faith, and those who have died alone, unloved and unmourned. Gather them all into communion with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with all your saints. Then at last will all creation be one, all divisions healed and we shall join in singing your praise through your Son, Jesus. For through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, almighty God, forever and ever. Because we are all creatures in the love of the Lord, we can call upon our loving God and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil, and grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from needless worry and anxiety as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. My sisters and brothers, may the peace of Christ be with each of you. Let's share that with one another. Peace, peace. Peace be with you. 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 Thank you. Sisters and brothers, this is Jesus, the Son of the living God, here in our midst. Happy are we who gather round this table. Lord, I am thy worthy, you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. May the body and blood of Christ bring us all to life everlasting.
Let's continue to pray together. O oh Lord, may the working of your power increase in us so that renewed by our sharing in this heavenly meal, we may one day be prepared by your grace to receive the fullness of the promise which you offer to us. And we make this through Christ our Lord. The snapshot, our weekly or a monthly newsletter, um, was sent out on November 1st. And uh, anyone who's a registered personer for whom we have an email should receive one. If you didn't, um, please contact our office. And this will give you a look ahead at what kind of activities and spiritual offerings we have for the coming month. Next Sunday, November 12th, there's a Social Concerns Committee is offering a presentation at 945 on navigating conflict. This will be followed by a workshop Sunday, November 19th from 1230 to 330, just in time for those Thanksgiving family gatherings that <laughs> might be a little tense. November 15th, um, local musicians and readers will offer an evening of reflection wrapped in the arms of God, words and music to soothe the grieving heart, and this will be at 7 p.m. here in church. There's still room on our pilgrimage to Greece, uh, which will be uh, take place October 2024, walking in the footsteps of St. Paul. Um, the itinerary and price information is available at the doorways. November is the month of all souls, and we remember our loved ones. We invite you to place their photographs on the windowsill, but um, also, if you would like, you can write their names, the names of um, many people you would like to have remembered, and place them on the bulletin board in the parish hall. The, uh, let's see, there's an item in the bulletin about spiritual practices, which is incorrect, uh, so, um, even, uh, it's not actually going to be happening as it's depicted, so just disregard that notice. Tonight, we want to remember to turn our black clocks back. We get an extra hour of sleep unless you have a dog that gets up regardless of what time <laughs> it is. So, um, but for those who don't, have an, enjoy yourselves and don't forget to turn your clock back. Are there any birthdays or anniversaries or other significant events to know? No? May you enjoy a blessed week. Christina, do you have your hand up? Oh, it's your birthday? Happy birthday, Christine. May you enjoy a blessed week. Let's stand and ask for God's blessing. May the Lord bless us and keep us show his face to us and have mercy on us. May the Lord turn his smile toward us and give us peace. And may Almighty God bless us today and throughout the week in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our liturgy is ended. Let us live in the peace of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.